when they actually spend their time listening to this show. What does it mean? It means we're winning. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show most Tuesdays, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash echoplex media. Support this project at patreon.com slash echoplex or at eplex.store. Uh, $5 and up, you get the entire uh, audio and video capture of all our podcast recording sessions, including Red Light. And uh, you get it a day early, plus you get to feel good knowing that you support independent media and the, uh, I guess, the ninth best local news uh podcast in california i'm producer dave and i'm a better streamer with one arm than all the other streamers are with two (laughs) and this is the councilman uh still rocking two arms but uh definitely not as good as producer dave um in terms of the podcast and um happy to be here as always um lovely having you here listener and viewer uh we love your live viewing we love your downloading so please keep doing both of those things and keep us the ninth best local news podcast according to some dude in california 
Um, but uh, you can find me on the Twitter X place at T H E underscore councilman. Um, sometimes I get spicy. Sometimes I'm not even there. Uh, and you may not notice me at all, but I've, you know, my 140 followers definitely ap- appreciate all I have to offer. So you should definitely join them at some point if you, uh, you're so inclined. Fantastic. Um, what do we have for leading off? Well, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, the story we've been covering and has been dominating the news here in the Bay Area political scene for the past few weeks is the investigation into the Zhong family and their contributions to local politicians. And we're not quite sure why we're, they're getting uh, investigated now, but we're pretty sure it has something to do with like crime. Um, but it's also entangled uh, Mayor Sheng Tao, who's already dealing with a, a, whatever you, you know, a recall effort, whatever you want to think about that. So uh, lots of shite is happening, and a uh, new subpoena is giving us more information about what the FBI is actually looking into. So we're going to learn more now from KPIX. We are getting our first look at a grand jury subpoena that's shedding new light on the recent FBI raids in Oakland. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Northern California has ordered the city to hand over a trove of documents of interest to investigators. It is the first indication of what the FBI may be after following raids on the home of Mayor Shang Tao she shares with her partner, as well as locations belonging to the politically influential Duong family, which owns the recycling company California Waste Solutions. So Katie Nielsen's in studio now. She has been digging into this. The FBI has been very tight-lipped, but we're certainly learning a little bit more about what we're finding out in the subpoena, correct? That's right, Juliet. So I actually have a copy of that subpoena Mm -hmm. that was issued to the city attorney's office. It's only eight pages, but there are specifics here related to the mayor and her partner, Andre Jones, as well as the Duong family and their business dealings with the city. The FBI hasn't answered any questions about why the mayor's home was searched in the early morning hours of June 20th or what agents were looking for. But just five days after the raids on June 25th, the FBI demanded documents from the city attorney related to the case, asking for any communications around Mayor Tao's campaign, meetings she's taken, who she met with and what was discussed, as well as any communications having to do with the Duong's businesses. The feds want documents going back to January of 2020, just a few months after Tao announced she was running for mayor. The feds are looking both at the campaign of the mayor as well as conduct that occurred afterwards. Stephen Clark is a former prosecutor and now a criminal defense attorney and says based on the documents the FBI is asking for, he believes this is a pay-to-play investigation and the FBI is looking for evidence of possible bribery or public corruption. Was there some connection between campaign financial activities and the subsequent conduct of a city official? That would never happen. No, God, no. The FBI is also requesting information about the mayor's partner, Andre Jones, including any documents or communications with him, as well as information about any meetings he might have attended. Uh, Partner, partner. Last week in an interview with CBS News Bay Area, Tao denied Jones had any involvement in her administration. And absolutely not. You know, I've been on the city council where he's never actually, um, you know, been on any payroll. That's really easy to confirm. Uh, You know, he's hardly even been in my office. And so, um, yeah, that's there's no truth to that at all. Now, we have reached out to the mayor's office for comment on these subpoenas. They referred us to the city attorney's office. The city attorney's office said it did not have a comment. Yeah, I know, Katie, you've been doing a lot of digging, a lot of our newsroom looking into this, reading that subpoena, trying to get as much information as we can. But the mayor has made statements in the past. So what have we learned from that? So she has. Just one day before the FBI issued Mm -hmm. the subpoena, she had that fiery press conference where she denied being the subject of any federal investigation. Then again, in that interview, you just saw a clip from last week right here on CBS Bay Area. She said the same thing again, that she is not the subject of the FBI investigation. Okay, so let's talk about the Duong family. And so what we know now is that they did donate to the mayor's campaign, um, also named in the subpoena. So what is their... Well, wait a minute. Didn't she say they didn't? Uh, I want to say she said that, yeah, that they didn't directly or maybe they, yeah, they hadn't. So this is news. All of this, if we know. So we don't fully know Mm -hmm. what the role is, but it is worth noting that on this subpoena, item number one pertains to California Waste Solutions, which is owned by the Duong family. 
That company holds the recycling contract for the city of Oakland. And remember, their offices were also raided on the same day that those agents went to the mayor's home and investigators are asking for any documents and communications regarding those city contracts. And so, Juliet, this subpoena is really broad. The FBI is asking for an absolute mountain of information. Mm -hmm. It could take the city attorney possibly weeks, even months to produce all of that, get all of those documents together. But eventually, whatever evidence is gathered could then be presented to a grand jury, and it would be up to those jurors to decide whether there is enough evidence to charge anyone with a crime. Yeah, and who will it be? All right, Katie, thank you. We'll continue to follow this as well. Oh, that's we weird. That. That's weird. That's kind of weird because the feds are, these um, documents requests are usually not uh, broad though i mean they're using the word broad the local news is using the word broad like you know what i'm saying yeah yeah uh it, it you know it, it they could just be fishing but um in a case like this uh if they've already done these kind of searches and they've tar made some uh they've identified some targets they probably have a good idea of what they're looking for so they can be pretty specific in their their asks um Public records requests can, though, be pretty vague um, when it comes down to it. They don't have to necessarily be super specific. The agency can always, or the public official can always say, go to, go to hell, I'm not going to respond um, and deal with the consequences and try to make a case if they ever needed to in court that, well, this was just, they were asking something that was above and beyond the pale and not, you know, and more information that I should be expected to compile uh, reasonably in a reasonable amount of time, right? That kind of thing. So, there are outs from it, um, but really only if they're in like a fishing expedition and they're looking much more broadly. I, if this probably is much more specific than than that, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and like I said, the news just maybe they don't even understand what it means. Maybe the, the maybe this is just very like for the type of and we don't even know the nature of the investigation yet. But there could be it mm -hmm. could just be that for the type and nature of this investigation that this is all like bog standard stuff to ask for. Yeah, very much so. Um, so, and it, and it could, and again, it could be that, and you know, we can take the mayor at her word. You know that she is, you know, innocent or whatever she said, right? And I'm innocent. Um, she's she hasn't done anything wrong, right? And she's not in any sort of legal trouble. Um, that could very well be the case. It's just you know stuff that can look really bad and actually be really bad, even if it's not you know necessarily illegal. Um, so it could be that she's she's just I mean tied up in this because she's uh, tangentially connected somehow um, or received one donation, didn't even know about it. Um, but um, the more that comes out and the more she defensive she gets about it, it doesn't look great. No, it doesn't. And the, the other thing is like these things, if it's, if it's big and they're looking at this company doing a lot of stuff, this is going to, this might outlast her administration, like the investigation and subsequent, uh, legal action may go even if she is not recalled right she may turn sure. out before this ends if this oh, sure. is a big like a big like kind of racketeering style case yeah correct and uh, so i don't know what the statute's limitations are on it but uh yeah the uh, it could take a while for all the facts to come out and in the meantime you know i just don't know how long you can go on with the line of you know uh, it, we're waiting for the investigation to play out. We're cooperating, right? At some point, you got to try to, if you know, if you are truly innocent, quote unquote, um, you do have to try to exonerate yourself somewhat in the court of public opinion because you're just going to lose that no matter what happens legally, right? They could throw the whole case out against you down the road, but if it's been like two or three years of investigation, <laughs> right, and no answers, then people will just remember you as the person who was being investigated, not the person who got exonerated. Yeah, and I mean, you know, <clears throat> if you were maybe not the mayor, you could just be like, hey, I haven't even been charged with a crime here. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but the mayor probably can't have... play that. Or you have to be no. a certain kind of mayor to be able to play that, right? Right. And it's you're dealing with, you know, the city attorney is probably having to defend her in some way in this, in this case. Um, and I don't know if she can have her own private attorneys but she probably wouldn't be able to afford them. I'm guessing to the level of like a Donald Trump or someone, right. Can afford to hire a whole a mountain of attorneys, even if they despise him and can't figure out what the, you know, don't, don't want to do anything. He says, at least they're paying him. Um, he can afford that, but I'm guessing she cannot. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. It, I don't know, dude, the, 
Pets, pets generally don't come for you if they ain't got it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they don't waste their time. They really don't have time to waste. So, um, yeah, they don't generally waste time on. Although stuff he, that they she, can't prove. she may not be the one that they're coming for, right? It may just be that she they thought that she might yeah. have this, that, or the other thing related to in an in uh, for her a non criminal and maybe not even shady way. They may be sure. you, they may show a pattern of behavior that may or may not include her that they want some information about, and it may be just that this business or the people running it are the real target. And that they mm-hmm. they done they really done fucked up somewhere else, yep. and not Towards necessarily possible. a fishing expedition here so much as a as a, a fact finding mission. Sure, or it's entirely possible that she knows something or has some leverage point that or some some you know point of evidence that they can leverage out of her. Right, um, if they say, "Well, got you doing this," what do you know? You know, um, yeah, yeah. We know we know you know this. You need to go on the record and say that you know this, or we're gonna throw the book at you over this stuff. So, okay. or it could go away. <laughs> yeah, it could all just. But if it goes away and nobody ever like says that the investigation has been closed or whatever or whatever, now now everybody yeah. just thinks she's still under investigation. Right. And then you're right; it does put her in a weird spot, like as far as uh, communicating with the public, especially regarding like her recall. Because you well, think the I recall think, yeah. people aren't going to be, even if they're not doing it through official channels, do you think they're not through unofficial channels going to be like, well, what was the FBI doing at your house, huh? They already are. They already are. I mean, they're already <laughs> I mean, leveraging that- this. It's perfect. It's perfect time. And whether or not there is some sort of conspiracy there, um, and I don't believe in coincidences necessarily, but it's incredibly good timing for them that this is happening, right? Like, yeah, but, and I mean, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't, I mean, th- things like this can move quickly, but I don't know if they move like as quickly as they would need to here. And I'm not sure the FBI gives a fuck about her recall. Well, I mean, a lot of times it's, it's, these are complaint driven processes, right? When these investigations happen, it's not because someone at the FBI or the IRS or the FPPC or FEC or whoever have you is sitting there going, da, 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 reading through all the reports stuff. Da, da, this looks good. Oh, look at this one. This is bad. No, it's definitely not like that um, ever. And code enforcement is just not like that at all. Uh, anyway, there's just not enough people doing it. It's all complaint driven. So theory would be that someone, you know, high up in the recall effort or someone in the recall effort somewhere, you know, also on a separate track, right? In addition to filing all the recall paperwork and getting the signatures and doing all the things, um, was, you know, filing complaints about Cheng Tao or about the Zhongs on the side, right? And getting and and getting this investigation rolling, right? Um, with potentially legitimate, you know, issues and evidence, but, you know, doing, but because it's complaint driven, right? It's, it's them driving the, the, the investigation and the story. So that's, that is actually entirely believable. Um, but, uh, and again, I don't necessarily believe in coincidences. It does seem like really good timing for them, right? So it could be that it was a parallel track effort and it just happened to pay off for them. Um, and maybe that was the fishing expedition, right? But it ended up turning up something legit uh, that the FBI is now looking into. I think the Zhongs are in a lot more trouble than Shang Tao is. Um, right, they that's my... Multi-million dollar business. Just my guess is that this yeah. is an investigation of this company. Yeah. And and if that's the case, company. if that's the case, if it's not specifically an investigation of the Oakland mayor, then it, it I think that it's likely uh, coincidental that. Yeah. Well, they pick up my trash, so I hope we get some money out of it if they go down. <laughs> so um, we got winners and losers next. Uh, if you're a regular on this show, you know that there are no winners unless you were rooting for for somebody. And then, uh, sorry, they probably lose. If you liked yeah, anybody in the story, they probably get fucked. <laughs> and who the fuck are you rooting for in this story? I don't know. Oh probably my no God. One. Fucking. Uh, Peter Thiel. I have I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts on this, but they're not down ballady thoughts. So maybe I'll save them for for another show. Um, but um, do not pick up the book Hillbilly Algae, and uh, I don't know. Don't don't vote for uh, JD Vance. Here's uh, ABC Seven News talking about uh, JD Vance being uh, picked as uh, the vice president uh, or the running mate for uh, one Mister Donald Trump. Former President Trump was last in the Bay Area on June sixth for a lavish campaign fundraiser dinner in San Francisco's Pacific Heights. It was there that some major players in the local tech and venture capital scene came together to pledge their contributions for his candidacy, and the momentum is carrying into the convention. ABC 7 News South Bay reporter Lauren Martinez is live with uh, this swell of Republican support coming uh, from Silicon Valley, Lauren. 
Dan, tonight I spoke with two Republicans with Bay Area organizations who are at the convention. Both said very positive things about J.D. Vance. One of them described Vance's path from an impoverished childhood to senator as the embodiment of the American dream. President Biden has become the symbol of an America in decline. This may be our present, but it does not have to be our future. Opening night of the Republican National Convention, San Francisco tech entrepreneur David now Sachs gave an enthusiastic Fuck David endorsement. Sachs. I see a party that is strong and unified behind President Donald J. Trump. And his pick for vice president, Senator J.D. Vance. On Monday, 39-year-old Ohio Senator J.D. Vance was announced as the Republican vice presidential nominee. Vance has moved through different business worlds. A Marine Corps veteran and Yale Law School graduate. Best uh, yes, from... Uh, <laughs> From meager means. <laughs> memoir, Vance spent years as a venture capitalist in San Francisco before heading into politics. We like people who, who know their way around the political world, but it's important you have somebody who knows their way around the business world because... You know, this is a country of entrepreneurs. Jason Clark, a member of the California Republican Party, spoke with us from outside the convention in Milwaukee. Because he's... Oh, they didn't let him in. You know, a lot of the issues around free speech right now and free expression are very central core tenants of, of the tech community, and I think he's going to be able to speak to that, especially in a, in a Trump administration. Vance was once an outspoken Trump critic. In 2016, he told ABC News that he didn't see Trump offering many solutions. Vance eventually changed his tune when he ran for the open Ohio Senate seat. We spoke with the chairman of the Santa Clara County Republican Party, who says in politics. People understand how politics works around here at the, at the convention. And, uh, you know, we saw on the Democratic side the way that um, Kamala Harris talked about Joe Biden during their primary. Elon Musk posted his support on his platform X. Congratulations, J.D. Vance. Excellent decision by real Donald Trump. People have become more comfortable uh, being out as Republican and supporting this ticket. A new campaign disclosure shows some of the Silicon Valley donors to Trump's re-election effort. David Sachs donated $250,000. The Winklevoss twins, who co-founded a crypto exchange, donated in Bitcoin. It's estimated their donations are worth more than $1 million each. <laughs> Live in San Jose, oh Lauren Martinez, ABC7 News. That's weird. They take Bitcoin now for the fucking what? president. Well, I don't know any vendors for presidential campaign that would take Bitcoin, like to do mailers or ads or anything of that nature. So um, good luck spending the Bitcoin. Um, I mean, they can just cash it out. I guess. I, I don't know how this shit works, to be honest with you. So good for them. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you can take anything these days. Venmo, whatever. As long as you document it, it's, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, unless there's limits, uh, in which case you don't want people giving more than the limit. But... Again, it's a complaint-driven process. So people were, um, people that I listened to were wondering <clears throat> sort of what the <clears throat> Peter Thiel wing of the party was going to do this time. And uh, now we know, because J.D. Yes. Vance is pretty much a wholly owned subsidi subsidiary of Peter Thiel. <laughs> like, yes, I think he's got a house in that uh, California Forever already reserved for him, a, a little summer home. So, right, and then right. in the, he's, I think I saw him in the background of the Norman Rockwell painting with his wife, <laughs> who resigned from her big fancy l uh, law firm position in San Francisco the minute this was announced, too, by the way, uh, just to avoid any entanglements. I'm, I'm a little surprised. I don't want to say, because it's a local show, I don't want to say too much. I don't think Vance brings much. I thought, I didn't, th I was surprised, honestly. I was surprised. Yeah. I thought of like a, uh, what's her name? Bobert or a um, South, Co South Dakota governor. What's her name? Oh, no, no, I'm Christy Noam. Yeah, to call I thought the it dogs. was going to be not necessarily somebody seen as more moderate, but somebody, <clears throat> I don't know, like more fun, I guess, kind of. And someone who I'm shoots using dogs. the term fun pretty loosely here, but. Yeah. Someone who shoots dogs. I think Christy Noam would have been great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the other thing, they're like, oh, his rags to riches story. And then they're like, he went to Yale. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> yes. They're like, he, like according to David beginnings. Sachs, right? According to David Sachs, who this was, oh, he was his parents. His parents were like just middle, middle class. Right. They went to Yale. He went to Yale. My goodness. Not Harvard. 
So uh, things are heating anyway. up in the presidential campaign in Lafayette. Apparently, there was a thing on an overpass. By the way, uh, in California, you are what they're doing here. You are not allowed to do this. Yeah, but it's a complaint-driven process. <laughs> <laughs> you are you are not allowed to uh, like basically use the overpass to promote or dispromote anything actually well that's i think that might have been what the the hecklers were t were telling them um and so they responded to the hecklers and there was just lots of heckling so we're gonna oh, find great. out more i'm sure that access the, the story i'm sure that this was normal all of it yeah of course daily this is the Curtola overpass in Lafayette, and since 9-11, it's become a kind of gathering place for conservatives to express their views. But on this day, it's also an example of how divided this nation has become. We believe in America. We believe we have a country to save. The flags are upside down because we're a nation in distress. This is a grievous time. I'm not being quiet. I'm not going away. We're not going away. Lisa Dispro put out a call for fellow Trump supporters to meet at the overpass. She's done it many times, and it's become a familiar sight for drivers on Highway 24. There was nothing inflammatory about the day's message, but it was enough to draw a pretty extreme response from some people. F you, get off this overpass, you racist Your kind is not allowed up here. Nobody you come up here all the you. time. No one stands with you, you racist <laughs> What are you going to do with this video? You are 100% evil. You are 100% You are 100% terrorist traitors to this country, just like him. And God damn you to burn in hell, death. You will burn in hell. I'm sorry that the guy was an inch off. That's pretty Whoa, lady, don't Whoa. say that. Don't go fucking shut up. <laughs> Think that if you want. People don't know their own American constitutional rights. They don't know. To be fair, you can't hang things from the overpass. It's an assault, if nothing else. No, we you weren't assaulted. Have to do that. We have mostly older ladies up here <laughs> waving flags. Is that older really bigot la the ladies that's going on? And 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 the. The heat? Al Norman doesn't trust the government and believes there were larger, sinister forces behind the attack on Trump. He says it feels like conservatives are losing their right to free speech, and that was only bolstered when a Caltrans truck showed up. Lisa says they've been kicked off the overpass six times now. No, you haven't. You've been told you need to remove the things that you were hanging from the overpass. Yes. Many you are, times. You are allowed to stand there on the sidewalk of the overpass with a sign that you are holding. Yes. But and you cannot hang things on the Caltrans property. The exchange, she urged her friends to make a stand. Suddenly, without explanation, the Caltrans truck left. They don't want the media! Woo! Why do you think they just left? They don't want you recording this! Well, there's more of you than them, so they're probably afraid for their lives. The eyes are on them! Today was the Alamo! Woo! But despite references to the Whoa. Alamo, there are Trump supporters who don't think politics should be a fight to the death. Joe Mueller was disturbed by what she saw on Saturday. Were you surprised that that would happen? That it could, it could go that far? I probably was, yeah. Because if he hadn't turned his head just that little fraction, he'd be dead now. I think it'd be really mm. hard on all of us. Yeah, I think that would be, a lot of people would be very unhappy about that, and it would not be good. A little scary? Very scary. Yeah, I think it's scary times we're living in. It's scary because it feels like the nation has stepped over a threshold. Whoa! We had a gun to guys last night! Ha <laughs> And no one on either side is willing to take a step back. Never. So... Wow. Um those people were that they showed I, I think those were crisis actors right let's 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 get conspiratorial ourselves and be like they're they they were they were paid they were paid provocateurs yeah i, I either that or they said nothing better to do but uh yeah I, I don't see anyone this is a typical winners and losers story i don't really see anyone worth rooting for in this story um uh there's plenty of ways to oppose what these folks are doing um like the legal way of telling caltrans hey they shouldn't be doing this um and getting caltrans to follow through <laughs> um or you know taking it up with them in a more civilized tone um i don't appreciate all the the cursing and the and all that madness um but 
you know, if you're looking at it from the other perspective, they are breaking the law. So um, citizens have a right to stand up for, for themselves and for their community and the safety of the drivers on the road. So, um, I think that she was like, oh, they don't want the Caltrain person probably doesn't, well, they probably don't want to be on the news, but they probably were called out there, probably called in and said, oh, there's like a lot of people out here. This seems to be a political thing. I'm here by myself. I'm not yeah. comfortable uh, taking this down. If you, you know, I guess it would be the county or the CHP, depending on who owns the, the overpass it's, that would have to come it's out. It's the state. It's the state. It's Caltrain. It's probably, um, and they so definitely don't get like paid the enough. CHP or state troopers or somebody to come out if the people like to, to refuse. Yeah, to secure the area while the Caltrans workers then removed the signage, right? Um, that would be the situation. So uh, if anything, they probably couldn't get back up like that. And yeah, if I'm a lonely Caltrans worker, I'm not putting my you know, butt on the line, even with a bunch of old ladies um, in that situation, like one on 10, right? Especially given what's going on right now. Everyone's talking like they're just talking about things are pretty volatile out there right now no idea what to expect. See, I wouldn't want to engage at all, frankly. I would have just seen that and been like, okay, let's go get the CHP. And if we can't, then we'll just let them hang their signs and they'll go away. Right. Right. Hopefully. It was interesting. The one thing the one guy said is, you keep doing this and no one comes out here. And I think that if, if he would have said, why, why do you keep coming here? There's like five people here. <laughs> and then he would have left. That would have been fantastic, right? People got to know, like what, especially with the news there, that yeah. <clears throat> making sure that with the cameras on you say something like that versus right whatever the fuck that guy was freaking screaming out about. bloody murder about that yeah and i i have a feeling he has a lot more going on than just getting upset with the trump supporters frankly he might be he might be the crisis actor who knows but um uh yeah i, I did i do want to point out that you know you can be a group of nice old white ladies and still be racist bigoted fucking terrible human beings i just right. want to point that out right like my mom's mahjong group is not immune to being a bunch of racist bigots um so just throwing that out there um and you can be young and sprightly and also be a racist bigot too <clears throat> so i hadn't seen anything about this story apparently right? there's no sign that an australian ceo was attacked and or left for dead i think i'd kind of oh wait a minute no 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 they, the, the fucking david sachs and them were making a big deal about this a while ago weren't they this is the Another one where they were like, "Oh, this guy, yeah, you know, like Bay Area killed this guy." And it's this is recent enough. This is um, it's not the same, but it's a recent uh, story of a CEO who apparently was found beat up, you know, disoriented on the street, and then claimed that he was attacked and left for dead. But apparently, there is no actual evidence of that happening. So now the question is, what actually did happen to this guy, and why is he potentially not being so truthful about it? Ah, well, let's see how the local news covers it. Right, I'm sure totally fairly brought you last night here at 11. The San Francisco Police Department says it went through surveillance video and found no sign that an Australian CEO was attacked on the 4th of July. It adds Colin Bettles was in possession of his property at the San Francisco General Hospital. Initially, it was reported his wallet and cell phone were missing. So the mystery in about exactly what happened continues. So okay, it so sounds not, like not as much I'm like a bar fight could be yeah um and just not wanting to to cop to it um in from out of town right maybe the the wife doesn't, doesn't want the wife to know what went down um while he was in vegas or san francisco uh yeah so mystery mystery unsolved we'll we'll keep looking sorry it was a very quick hit and they didn't have more on that i think he probably just got in a, a fight yes I, I think i saw this in an episode of ncis actually <laughs> so when i got the idea from tv Meanwhile, Gov Governor Gavin Newsom, in his uh, continued run for president in uh, 2028, is uh, shitting on the city of Oakland. Let's see what he has to say here. Acceptable lawlessness. That is how Governor Newsom describes the situation right now in the city of Oakland. He traveled here today to announce the moves the state is making to help the city. KTVU's Tom Vakar live tonight with the latest from Governor Newsom. Tom. Well, that move is more troops, but it did come with some rebukes. Governor Newsom called reporters to an Oakland towing yard to announce that he's increasing the deployment of CHP officers in Oakland, doing all manner of police work in Oakland and the East Bay. Patrolling Oakland's hotspots, including um, some of the ones <clears throat> on Broadway, Hagenberger area, multi-agency sideshow street racing operations, combating vehicle theft, recovering stolen cargo containers at the Port of Oakland, 
tackling fencing operations at Oakland. Stolen cargo containers. And combating commercial vehicle violations in or about Oakland. So far, the CHP has recovered 1,142 stolen cars, arrested 562 suspects, and seized 55 crime-linked guns. Now, even more CHP police power in Oakland. We're going to move the California Highway Patrol from 42 shifts that they're currently operating in Oakland. Uh, we're going to increase that fourfold. We're going to have 162 shifts uh, starting uh, next week. Uh, we're going to focus over the course of the next four months. To assure that those caught are really held accountable, the governor sent a notice to Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price that the state's attorneys he offered to assist the DA will be brought back into the Attorney General's office. Yes. We've been disappointed, uh, the uh, lack of engagement uh, with the DA's office. And so we're the plot thickens. Uh, rather than complaining about it, rather than uh, lamenting about it, uh, we're going to be moving some of the prosecution uh, to the state of California, the attorney general's office. Uh, we uh, needed just to pull the plug at this stage and, uh, and do something that we know will work uh, with the AG's office. At a Thursday afternoon press conference, District Attorney Pamela Price said this. I cannot speak to the governor's disappointment. As I say, I'm disappointed that the governor did not reach out to me directly, and I'm disappointed that the governor did not acknowledge the efforts that our office is making. State attorneys will prosecute Oakland cases that are complex and time-consuming. As to beleaguered Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao, Newsom says she was cooperative with the CHP coming to Oakland, but the timing of his assistance will end just before the November recall election. We can't be here forever. Uh, we're here for the next four months, and uh, we'll see what happens in the next four months. But uh, we, we said we, we were firm in our commitment. We weren't going to walk away. Mayor Tao issued this statement of gratitude to Governor Newsom for the new resources. She said, after years of rising crime rates, we are seeing a steady decrease. And we know that this is in part because of the strong partnership between the Oakland Police Department and the California Highway Patrol. Whatever happened, that offer of help from the attorneys from the Department of Justice to get to uh, the district attorney's office is a four-month process, and somehow it failed. It could be fixed, but time really is running short. Tom Baker, KTVU Fox 2 News. All right, Tom, thank you. I don't care where I'm, I am. <clears throat> if, especially if I'm just it's just a traffic violation. Boy, howdy, would I rather have the CHP pull me over than the some fucking local PD guy. <laughs> that's probably true and pro probably a good, good point there but um yeah you're absolutely right this is more gavin and his presidential run and getting more tough on crime because he's going to be painted um, by the gop and everyone else uh nationwide outside of california as lax on crime as the guy who let the gays get married and let the women do whatever they want with their bodies and uh just let the lawlessness run in the streets run rampant in the streets you know the, the criminals that shoot people on piers in san francisco and and uh nice blonde white ladies in almaden right got to crack down on all that to be seen as tough on crimes so you can get elected nationwide at least he thinks that we'll see we'll see I don't I don't know what this is if I don't know if this is this I this this could be one of two things it could be either kind of a political play against the powers that be in Oakland or it could be a political play by him to help for example the Xing Tao and maybe not to help the district attorney I I think it's more to help Gavin Newsom and oh, the yes, collateral of and then the uh, the district attorney might be collateral damage, and the mayor might be collateral like assistance, right? Um, where it, it, he's just doing what he's going to do, and it happen if it happens to benefit Shang Tao by helping you know her crack down in public safety and crimes, great. If it just, if it hurts Pamela Price because you know uh, the mayor's or the governor's calling her out specifically in her office out, that's a little interesting that he's doing that. Um, and if she's right that he didn't reach out before he made this decision, that's pretty surprising and shocking. Um, and upsetting and says a lot, um, but it could just be that they're collateral damage here. Right, right. <clears throat> Who knows? Who knows? We'll 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 see how. We'll find out more. I mean, we probably won't see how this goes though, right? Because like we're not the something like this. It's only a few months long. It's going to be hard to tell <clears throat> what, if any, impact this has because there could be larger trends going on with you know property crime and violent crime going down for other reasons. So we're mm -hmm. we're never going to know if if this was like useful or helpful i don't think when it comes to the crimes maybe politically we'll have a i think a better sense of how it's had an impact right um 
come November, come November, we'll definitely see if it's had a political impact because it would have a more immediate political impact than it would in the actual data and numbers. You're right. Like these crime trends just play out over much longer time frames. We got one more in winners and losers. What do we got next, Councilman? Oh man, everyone's losing here again. Uh, uh, so we've been following the never-ending travails of the Allen Rock School District in East San Jose, where of course you have kids who are uh, most vulnerable and most in need of good leadership, and they have none. <laughs> So uh, they've recently can't shit can their superintendent. The board is dysfunctional and fired its own president. And they're also looking at declining enrollment that's going to force them to close almost half of their schools in the next two years. So, oh, yay. Pa and parents are just overjoyed. Fantastic. Well, a new problem tonight for an already struggling local school board. Parents in the Allen Rock School District say they're fed up with all the infighting and the poor communication they say is coming from board members. And now some say they're considering some drastic measures to get things to change. NBC Barry's Damon Trujillo is in Allen Rock with a closer look at all that turmoil. The school board scheduled a special meeting on Saturday. The parents say they were caught off guard. They say they want to be included in the conversation or else. The Elm Rock School District in the South Bay is home to 21 schools, but now because of declining enrollment, board members are preparing to close nine of them by the fall of 2025. The district had 10,000 students enrolled before COVID. Today, it's down to about 7,600. I'm concerned about my child um, just because we don't know what the future entails. Parents gathered outside district headquarters today to outline the district's issues and vent their frustrations. They include anger over the closures, the fact that the district will start the school year without a permanent superintendent, and the lawsuit filed by 11 students claiming the district conspired to hide sex assaults by a music teacher now in prison. Whoa. And some fear that lawsuit could bankrupt the district. And on top of all that, Parents say the board has not communicated well with them. When we stop having that communication, that's when things get more um, intensified. And that's when parents feel like they don't have a choice. Christine with a Y is just pissed that she doesn't live in Willow Glen, let's be real. Some are even floating the idea of student walkouts or a recall of board members if things don't change. Oh, I understand that the parents are frustrated. And uh, I want to reassure the parents that... Uh, as a member of the board, I'm committed to meeting the parents wherever they are. By majority vote, the board already kicked out the board president in May, just months after firing the district superintendent. Parents say they've seen this before a few decades ago. That's when they say infighting among board members got in the way of progress. There is a deep division on the board on how to deal with declining enrollment. Uh, I'm not denying it. Parents say they've had enough and don't want a repeat. They also say they won't be ignored. It doesn't feel like there's the collaboration we'd like to see. Uh, we're here to give them an another chance to be here to, to have that conversation. The children of Alam Rock head back to school in just over three weeks. Damien Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. Wait, what the fuck? School starts in August now? Yeah, it's uh, it shifted a lot. Um, so they get out by, by the end of May now, and then they haven't. Uh, they're off until like mid August at this point. Um, most schools are doing that now. It used to be more of a private school thing. That's that's what my high school experience was like. But uh, uh, now it's more of the public school setup. They're taking. Um, they're also taking more time off during the year to some extent. Just like an, they've added another week vacation in the fall so you get like an october week off right um and then uh, in addition to everything else so that shortened up the summer break basically gotcha um, but all had to be negotiated with teachers of course and, and staff so it was all on all above the board but parents don't get involved in those negotiations because you know one they're not staff and they're not employees of the school district and they're just constituents um so they don't actually get to make decisions like that on the the, the school calendar they have to just have to deal with it August being August, are the schools air conditioned now? That's a very good question, Professor Dave. Uh, most districts, especially in California, um, certainly have um, HVAC systems for all of their facilities. The relative, you know, um, age and quality of those systems is certainly varied across school districts, depending on how much how many resources they have to keep them upgraded, right? Um, oftentimes, when a school district is going for, as we talk about on ballot box bingo, if they're going out for a bond measure, right, as opposed to a parcel tax measure, a school district, if they're asking for bond funding, that's generally to do 
facilities upgrades like that, right? So um, every 10, 15 years, you're, they're supposed to upgrade or replace their HVAC units. Um, and uh, so that's how they pay for it with our tax dollars. Um, the tax dollars of homeowners, by the way, too, not, not you know, um, renters, although the cost gets passed along to renters, I'm sure, very much so. So the high school that I went to has been like full, fully replaced with a whole ass other high school. But what I remember <clears throat> is that there were portable units that were uh, there as classrooms. And uh, those were the ones you wanted at the very beginning or the very end of the school year for your classes. Because you know what? Those had air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And sure. the uh, old building that was there, best I could Did tell, not. didn't have no fucking air conditioning. <laughs> or really inefficient that's been air conditioning that's been like grafted onto a building that wasn't meant to have it in the first place, right? That's what you have in a lot of older schools. So um, yeah, it costs a, cost a lot of money. Uh, to do that, especially in bigger districts. So yeah, they if they don't have the resources from their community, like here in South Bay and the Bay Area, we tend to have a lot of property owners and a lot of you know money lying around in those properties um, and property taxes. So there is the, there are the resources to do these things, but the downside is that you can't pay use that money to pay for people, the people that actually do the work in the buildings, right? The teachers, the staff, um, and everything else, and the book, even the books. Um, so, uh, that's the bigger challenge is once you get the buildings built and you get the AC working, you know, you can't, can you have the classes? Can you have, do you have adequate people to actually do the work of teaching and educating our kids? And then are the kids still there, right? Are they, are they going off to charters? Are they leaving the area? Cause it's too co costly to live here. Um, are they going to private schools for the families that can afford it? Right. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a mess and, uh, it's not getting any better when county, education executives decide to misuse funds and misappropriate funds and uh, finally get called out over it, <laughs> which is what we're going to talk about under get your shit together tonight. It's pretty rare that, <clears throat> that I would, would not have thought that Santa, Santa Clara County, uh, San Jose has been in the, 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 the virtual uh, figurative uh, crosshairs of <clears throat> get your shit together. But I don't think, the county any of the county departments for santa clara have had this honor yet although we're as we near episode 200 of down ballot i could be totally wrong here i've i would have i would be hard pressed to rem recall and it's actually worth pointing out this is going to be about the county office of education which is pretty much its own entity it has its own board its own governance structure it's not a county department technically even though the county does have some adjacent oversight over it but it's got its own budget and its own superintendent and own processes so and they don't really have any schools that they 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 run programs more so than schools so gotcha. a lot of the special all the special ed programs in the county for the most part are run through the county office of ed um and other other development programs like that so that's primarily what they focus on anyway and head start and youth programs you know k through five or uh, uh zero through five education and early care and education so looks like um there's a huge fund of uh, money that comes from, I believe, the state called Head Start. It's supposed to be spent on early care and education, and it doesn't look like the county office of education was spending it in the right places. And we're going to find out more in this exclusive investigation from NBC. Tonight, a story you'll see only on NBC Bay Area. We until Ooh. tomorrow. We're there as federal monitors arrived in San Jose today to investigate the Santa Clara County Office of Education. Our like investigative unit has confirmed the county office is under investigation over how it spent federal funds. Let's bring in investigative reporter Candace Wynn. Uh, Candace, this could be very serious here. What do we know right now? Yeah, the investigation is looking into Santa Clara County's Head Start program, which is federally funded and helps low-income children with early development. So far, the investigation has found some of the money meant for Head Start was used to pay another employee's salary and travel expenses. Because I thought it was important that these things be sought out and that they be investigated. 2024 was the first year Yadira Orozco got involved with Santa Clara County's Head Start program as a parent and now chairperson of its policy council. Head Start, what it's really providing is the foundation for learning that children This spring, she started digging into the program's financials. And that's when I started to come about finding uh, misuse of funds for um, staff that wasn't even a part of the Head Start program. They were being paid. I came across uh, staff or employees who were 
also on leave or who are not employees anymore, but are still getting paid um, by Head Start. Orozco says she first went to the Santa Clara County Office of Education for answers, but didn't get a response. The county office did open an internal investigation. In late May, Orozco says she reported her concerns to Head Start's regional office in San Francisco. It was important to reach out to regional because we need to know where our money is going. It's our program's money, our children's money. Monday morning, NBC Bay Area's investigative unit was at the Santa Clara County Office of Education when six federal officials arrived. They confirmed they were with the Office of Head Start, but didn't provide additional comment. According to this letter from Head Start's regional... Yeah, and that mob of administrators is the, not who you want to see County showing up. ...school superintendent Marianne DeWan. Right, not that early in the morning. On April 16th, the regional office notified DeWan's office of their request for a formal investigation into allegations of inappropriate and misuse of federal funds. Yao said they received an additional complaint as well. Orozco believes she's that additional complaint. Head Start's regional office requested more answers from the county office's ongoing internal investigation. According to the county's report, the only misallocated position was in fact the director, early learning and care initiatives, which is a county school's position, not part of Head Start. Between January and June of this year, the internal investigation found $131,000 of Head Start grant money incorrectly went to that director's salaries and benefits, and another $4,300 went to the person's travel expenditures. Hello, I'm Dr. Marianne DeWan. You are Santa Clara County Superintendent of Schools. We requested an interview with Superintendent DeWan to find out how that happened. She didn't respond, but her executive director and spokesperson sent us a statement calling the issue an accounting error, which was promptly fixed and that should have been identified and addressed by the end of the fiscal year. It was a five, over a five month error. I mean, how can they explain that? If I didn't, um, hadn't come across this error, what would have happened then? The superintendent's executive director also wrote, we understand that building and maintaining public trust in the programs and services we offer is of paramount importance. Accountability, of course, is critical. This is a program that's for the low-income families specifically. We don't want the, the money and the funds to go where they're not supposed to. This is our program, and we have a right to know what is being done with our funds and our program. Orozco told us Santa Clara County's Head Start director was placed on leave in March. We reached out to him, but he had no comment. Two people close to this investigation tell me that director had also reported concerns about how the county office was handling Head Start funds before he was placed on leave. With the investigative unit, I'm Candace Wen, NBC Bay Area News. <clears throat> it could literally be an accounting error, but I'm I'm not I'm not confident that that's the case here. Yeah, uh, and if it is, it's more just um, negligence, and it, it's just another example of um, uh, folks just not doing their job, and, and no one's watching the till, and things just get carried over and carried over budget cycle after budget cycle because no one's actually paying attention, you know. And I'm not one of those zero budget, you know, b b uh, base budget type people who say we just need to zero everything out and start over from scratch by no means. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no need to do that, but there absolutely is a need to, to go through the budget every year and to figure out what positions are being filled, what, how are they being filled? How are we paying for them? Um, and especially if there's state grant funding and other funding out there that is paying for these positions. And if you're spending it wrong, you don't get the funding again, right? You could risk losing that funding in the future. I've worked in enough nonprofit spaces to know that you have to account for and you have to report back and you have to be able to show how you spent the money and that you did it appropriately. Or again, you're not going to get the money again, right? So um, yeah, this is a little dis it's disappointing. It's not surprising. Um, and we'll certainly keep keep an eye on it. But again, it, but once again, it impacts the most vulnerable kids, right? Low-income families right. like she's talking about. Um, folks like families like The Good Wife works with um, in East San Jose, right at her job, her gig now. This is exactly the kind of organization that gets funding like Head Start funding to do these programs. And it's it's sad that part of it's being diverted to, you know, uh, someone who's probably doing a great job doing what they're doing, but they shouldn't be getting money 
do their job from this program, right? They've, they sh- their money should be coming from some other salary should be coming from elsewhere. Um, so someone's getting, you know, someone's benefiting from this, whether or not it's, you know, whether or not they're complicit in it or not, or complicit just by being silent about it. And like, I guess good on the gal who they were interviewing, <clears throat> who like just got in as a, would she say she was the board or, or part of some, some regional uh, thing for yeah, she, this, this program and she just got in and she she just hit the ground running and was like trying to figure out what's going on good for her hell yeah yeah it's a state program and then they have each um there's a like a community board advisory board uh in each area right and so she's the chair the new chair of our local board for head start um and again they don't have that they don't have the teeth that like they can set the policy and determine where the money goes necessarily but they have oversight capability like and they just don't always use it these groups so good on her absolutely and good on more school boards too for stepping in and doing their job which is supposed to be oversight and looking into these things so good on her hopefully it's a good example she's setting all right now it's time for down ballot watch our first one is um san francisco mayoral candidate who i barely remembered is running for mayor and has no chance of winning is going to talk about uh public safety and how he as never going to be the mayor is going to uh, make the city of san francisco a safe place where you can still wear flowers in your hair maybe we should put this under get your shit together um but i don't know how long we're going to make it through this he's really painful um uh, to our values so let's just let's just it's like if peter Thiel was running for mayor of san francisco honestly um but let's see how far we get Building a better Bay Area means giving you the information you need to vote. And what happens in the San Francisco mayor's race will impact not just the city, but the entire Bay Area. So and we're talking with each of the five top mayoral candidates all this week on ABC 7 News at 3. Join us today, founder of the nonprofit Tipping Point Community, Daniel Lurie. Daniel, thanks so much for making yourself available and coming on the show. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much for making sure everyone knows how fucking rich you are, too, by showing the background <laughs> behind you. Like, that's not a fake background, too, right? That's not like a, a Zoom backdrop. Re- that is his room. <laughs> that's real, and that that is like cherry wood imported from the fucking jungle of some fucking country. <laughs> and travertine marble behind it. <laughs> wow. Dude, do the shit in your kitchen. It sounds like shit, but I, at least I, it looks like you're a person. I think I see an artisanal cupcake on the shelf there, too. <laughs> That that gong is from the fucking I don't know I was gonna, there was gonna be I was gonna make try to make some joke about like that gong is five hundred years old. The prime minister of Japan presented him with that gong. <laughs> for being such a badass. For me. It's just uh, nice to have you, and just to let our viewers know, since you're the first one to kick this off, uh, I'm gonna ask several questions that are gonna be the same of every candidate. Starting with, okay. why do you want to be mayor of San Francisco? Oh, Nothing else come on, that's a softball. I love that question. <laughs> I love this city. Uh, I'm running because I've always been proud to call San Francisco my home. My wife and I were raising two young kids. We have a 13-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old son, and I want them to always be as proud of this city. I want all of our kids to have that same sense of pride that oh, I Oh, great. Do you send your kids to public school? And simply put, the direction that our leaders have taken us leaves me worried. Kristen, we know this. We tell people uh, when we're traveling that we're from San Francisco, people used to say, oh, greatest city in the world. Now they say, are you safe? Are, are you okay? And I don't make, you know, I'm not trying to make light of it, but it, we have taken a huge reputation hit, reputational hit, and simply put, we need accountable leadership and we need new ideas right you've and buildings that stand up straight administration for uh, quote failing on public safety uh, you're talking about that now so what specific measures would you implement to improve public safety and reduce crime in the city first you have to be for public safety throughout your term and you can't just be for public safety during an election year and that's what we've gotten from this administration and 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 frankly the the one before it as well we need a fully staffed police department, a sheriff's department, and a 911 dispatch office. We also need to make sure that we get our police out of the business of being our homeless outreach workers and our mental health counselors. Uh, I want uh, trained clinicians going out onto the street and working with people that are in mental health crisis or in the throes of addiction, bringing those people into 24 seven crisis centers and making sure that we get them the help that they need. That way, we have officers able to go walk the beat out on patrols. We need our officers to be able to do their jobs again. So there was right, something, there's something to be said about cops walking around in the community. But, like, the problem is 
that's like sort of an old school thing. And like the last place I ever was at where I ever even saw that was Campbell. And it's mm-hmm. like, they, there was like two of them. They didn't wear their, their sidearm and they just kind of walked around and talked to everybody who was hanging out at the bar. It seemed like it was fun for them. You know what I'm saying? It seemed like they yeah. weren't, they weren't really on the beat so much. I don't even know what it was. I think it was, I think it was, I think, I think it was just a thing that the city of Campbell did for its own image. If you ask me. Could be, could be, um, and but it could be a piece of a broader picture around, yeah, rebuilding trust with uh, community between community and, and law enforcement. Um, a lot of cities are working, are doing that. Um, San Jose has actually invested some in downtown foot patrols again um, on a one-time but somewhat ongoing basis, um, trying to Im- to do just that. Right? I get, I don't know what it. It's gonna. I don't know what it's gonna do in terms of impacting you know crime data and statistics and the actual crimes, but um, in terms of that more um, anecdotal, uh, you know, community building kind of way, right? The the non measurable way. Um, I think they're hoping that it'll have some success there. So I'm just wondering how that would look in San Francisco because, like, <clears throat> the San Francisco, like, yeah, there's a downtown, but like all this stuff is neighborhoodized pretty, pretty, pretty dramatically. Yeah. So would it just be like some cushy job where a couple cops, a couple like good looking guy cops walk around the Castro and everybody's like, Ooh, girl, look at that cop. Ooh, it I don't would, like the cops, it, but ooh, you know. I'm sure given, nowadays, especially with like a Daniel Lurie, this guy with, you know, and, and, um, ever all, everyone else, it seems like is so obsessed with analytics and data and numbers. Right. So it would more than likely be, yeah, they would pick neighborhoods like the Tenderloin, um, or they just would say the tenderloin because they always like to punch the tenderloin in the nuts. Um, but they would say, yeah, the tenderloin, and we would we would emphasize that neighborhood, right, and put the and put the foot patrols there, right. If they were able to free the, these cops up to do foot patrols, they would say we're going to prioritize the tenderloin and Soma or whatever or Mission, whatever whatever neighborhoods they feel uh, are in most need, um, whether it's based on data or just traditional and racist and you know systemic. Um, uh, uh, prejudices. So, I also want to touch on housing affordability since you already kind of talked about homelessness just now. Ooh. But how do you plan to increase the housing supply and ensure affordability? I plan to divide this room into four yeah, just, studio apartments. <laughs> yeah, t- turn his house into three houses, please. Start there. Start with his neighborhood. <laughs> Was this guy live on Billionaire's Row? Right. This room is a studio apartment size right there behind him. Yeah. So. Like we we need to build housing at all levels, as you just said. Uh, I'm the only one in this race that's actually done it. I've built housing on time, under budget, with good paying union labor. Uh, we need to make sure that we unlock the potential uh, that is sitting there. We actually have 70,000 units that have already been approved. Uh, we need to unlock that. Uh, and simply put, uh, the City Hall insiders have not gotten the job done. And they've had decades of experience and look at where it's led us. I've actually had a lot of conversations today talking about middle income housing, uh, our workforce, our police officers, our firefighters, our teachers, our nurses can't afford to live in the city. 80% of our police officers and our firefighters, 80% of them live outside of San Francisco because there's no chance of them being able to afford to live here. Mm -hmm. We can change that. We need to build more housing. And I've done it. And so I'm confident that we can accomplish this. Other than housing, certainly more. They could bring back the old school firehouse that doesn't never really existed where all the fire men, because back then it was men, they all lived there and none of them were gay or anything. Right. Uh, they were just friends. Development and vitality. What is your pandemic recovery strategy? Um, what are specific plans for economic growth and job creation? Uh, it starts with public safety and clean streets and inviting businesses back to San Francisco. Um, I was proud to be asked by Mayor Lee to bring Super Bowl 50 here. I led the bid and the host committee for that. Uh, we brought $240 million worth of economic revenue to San Francisco and to the Bay Area. Proud to have led that effort and also involved and engaged with bringing uh, World Cup is coming here. We just had a weekend full of uh, soccer tournaments across this world. And uh, and Super Bowl 60 is coming here. And we have the NBA NBA. So wait a minute, wasn't Super Bowl 60 not coming here, going to Santa Clara? Uh, well, yeah, technically, but it's the, it's coming to the Bay Area. All-Star game it, coming the, in 2025. So we need more of that, but it starts with making sure that we invite business back to San Francisco, small businesses and big business. Uh, 
I have a plan to do it. You can go read more about it on my website at DanielLurie.com. All right. I realize there's a board of education, so a mayor can only do so much. But what initiatives would you support to try to improve education and devote resources uh, at a time when extreme budget cuts are forcing school closures and, and also you have low test scores? It's a really important question. And you're right. The mayor doesn't have direct control, but you have the megaphone as mayor. You can make sure to speak out about making sure that student outcomes are at the heart of everything, that we take care of our teachers But we also have to make sure our schools have the resources that they need for the whole family, for the parents as well. We need to surge resources to our schools. You have Department of Children, Youth and Families. You have the Muni budget to make sure that kids can get to and from school safely and efficiently. So there are other tools at your disposal as mayor. I'm going to speak out and speak up because for us to have a world-class city again, for us to be that world-class city that we all know that we can get back to, we need a world-class public education system. Yeah, you can just pretend, should everybody just start pretending tomorrow that San Francisco is a world-class city again, and that'll be the new fucking, that'll be the new narrative in two years. Get the fuck out of here. And I will speak out on that every Fucking, s- fucking, fucking uh, deport David Sachs. Single day as mayor. I think, all right. Just send him people- to San Jose for a while. Those people can deal with him for a little bit. Then he can, <laughs> then he can go to Oakland for a while. You know, maybe send him, send him to the Burbs, send him over to Fremont for a little bit. Yeah, David Sachs in San Jose would be awesome. <laughs> know that you are an heir to the Levi Strauss fortune, and uh, you are extremely wealthy. And you are <laughs> no <from> shit. <laughs> that's just hitting the nail right in the head. That's his qualification. And that's it. Not even, right. not even new money, old money. The nonprofit sector, right? Leading that. Uh, none of those are bad things. But what I'm trying to say is, there are people who wonder about your relatability to to uh, mm-hmm. everyday citizens, and do you really understand both how city government can work to solve their problems and the challenges they face? I've worked with every mayor since. Just say, uh, let them eat cake and hang up the call. Mayor Newsom, right. through to this current mayor on issues. Let them eat cronuts. Uh, at every turn in my life, Kristen, I have been in service to community. I understand that people have questions about my background. I'm going to ask people to uh, look at the choices I've made with my life. And it's always been about service. Uh, I've helped house over 40,000 people who were homeless over the last nine years here in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, I've built housing on time and under budget, 145 units of affordable housing. And on the relatability thing, I'm a father. I have a 13-year-old daughter, a 10-year-old son, Kristen, you know, as a parent, uh, when your child struggles uh, with a health issue, which my daughter did recently uh, last year, um, it put things in perspective for me. And so uh, I've committed. You're like, boy, howdy, is it good that I'm the Levi Strauss heir? Right. Our health care is fucking excellent. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Life to serving this community. I'm a father that cares deeply about the health and wellness and the happiness of my two children. Um, and, and I, I guess I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to let the voters choose. Right. Um, but my you. commitment has always been to this city, and it will be as your mayor. We'll have to leave it at that because we're out of time. But uh, San Francisco mayoral candidate, Bye. Daniel Lurie, thank you so we much. We got through the whole thing. It was only thank seven and a half agonizing minutes. Not bad. Not bad. And the, the right many stories are pretty brief anyway. But um, yeah, so that's Daniel Lurie, ladies and gentlemen. Um, his dad also was the co-owner or the owner of the Giants at some point, too, and almost moved the Giants to Tampa Bay. So uh, there you go. Maybe San he and David Sachs can move to, to the core. Maybe he and David Sachs can move to Tampa. Did you know? Um, did you know Tampa is right next to um, Clearwater? Clearwater? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I, I think they'd be they'd be... Uh, happy as clams there we can we can buy them a plane ticket do we have any extra in the patreon budget no 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 we oh certainly, okay that, that well would. maybe they can afford maybe they have a plane they might have planes of their own that they can just like get into <laughs> they, they can fucking buy one if they don't even have one right and they're and they're probably housed in san jose international by the way that's where most of the private uh, jets are here now uh, they're in moffitt but mostly at sjc well, um, you know how we like to say elections have consequences? Yeah. Well, the, that's why this is on down ballot, because this is a, it's a pretty quick hit, but it's basically a follow through on a ballot measure that was on uh, the ballot in March in San Francisco that we uh, raised a red flag about and thought was pretty shitty. And now it's turning out to be pretty shitty. So let's find out more from NBC Bay Area. 
Well, there is no vote tonight, but San Francisco's police commission is carefully moving towards fulfilling a proposition voters passed in spring about big changes to the department. One that includes new rules to expand when officers can chase fleeing suspects. NBC Bay Area's Tom Jensen has more from City Hall. In the end, the commission did not vote on the most controversial policy change when officers can pursue suspects, but they moved the ball forward and will vote next week. The San Francisco Police Commission's policy change would allow officers to initiate car chases even if they believe a crime is about to be committed. Current policies only allow pursuits in violent felonies and suspects in drug sales, burglaries of businesses, and sexual assault cases. The pursuit policy required the most changes in response to Prop E. It was where there was the most disagreement before Prop E passed. Civil rights groups have come out against broadening the pursuit powers of officers, citing state attorney general data which shows black drivers are six times more likely to be pulled over than white drivers. The new policies would also mean that sergeants maintain the ability to end pursuits at any time. Police Chief Bill Scott said one of the most significant changes will be policies eliminating redundant paperwork, freeing up officers to walk beats and patrol the streets. It does save a lot of time. And I think that's the whole idea behind this is to... Oh, it's like the roughie said, if you die before the sun comes up, the paperwork will take forever. Yeah, <laughs> correct. The chief and Mayor London Breed say in the first six months of 2024, the city's crime rate is the lowest in 10 years. Mayor Breed said in a written statement, quote, but we cannot and will not let up because we have a lot more work to do to make our city even safer. She added the voters approved Prop E and now we're doing the work to put policy into practice. The pursuit policies face that preliminary vote by the commission next week, and then it's on to the police union for their approval before a final commission vote either later this summer or early in the fall. In San Francisco, Tom Jensen, NBC Bay Area News. So I, I've always just thought that uh, police chases double, triple, and quadruple the number of cars traveling through your community at dangerous speed. Like that's been my my take on these kinds of chases because then not only is the person who's fleeing that fleeing but now they may be inclined to take uh, greater risks with their own safety and the safety of the people in the community as they try to escape uh, the police who are pursuing them in a, correct in a, in a, in a, in a, at a at a rapid pace correct and it's not as though there's some sort of advanced police group in front of these chases right like that's alerting the community members and folks who may be like crossing the street or walking around with their kids or whatever what have you right or just just to mind their own business that this massive uh you know loud noisy dangerous uh conflagration of cars is coming right there's no warning right it's usually the, the the person being chased flying through your neighborhood and then followed by like you said the phalanx of poli of black and white so yeah um this is not going to be problematic at all i'm sure <laughs> so not, not to mention they can they can do pre-crime right they can say oh i think this person's about to do something we should chase that's them. crazy actually yeah that's yeah I, I don't know how, i don't know what that means like i don't know how they how you justify that what do you like what is that is that sort of like search and seizure where you have a you have a reasonable uh uh, understanding or expectation that someone has drugs on them so you can search them? Um, what, what, or you have a reasonable expectation this person is going to commit a crime so you can f chase them or you know hunt them down? Like, I don't get this. So, it seems very, very problematic. This would be fine if it, uh, and it may, there may be distinctions. Like, pursue these, pursue someone on foot all you want, baby. Because, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, max, if, if there's a, if people are literally chasing each other around, I think max people would be weighing 250, right? <laughs> like <laughs> can't can't run away or chase somebody for very long if you're like a, if you're a big a, a, you know some I could be I mean I could be wrong here but right but I'm just thinking of the physics of the difference yeah. in the physics of a of a chase on foot versus like in yes. multiple vehicles yeah well in fact a former council member Pete Constant in San Jose who was a cop um uh, before he was on the council but he ended up in traction because of this very thing he was chasing a perp and fell and just tore his back up um he was not necessarily in great shape to begin with so right um but so yeah <laughs> that would be very also, interesting um, if they, uh, that was in the madcap blooper is far more po possible on foot chases Oh, absolutely. If you're going to, if you're going to wear body worn cameras, I mean, if you're going to have to wear these cameras, you might as well make the footage interesting, right? And not super boring. So, um, let's but, go for it. Let's but for, for real, like, I think that the, the circumstances under which the police take chase in this, in this way, all uh, like streets of San Francisco or, uh, you know, what was that the famous chase scene in the, what was the French Bullet. connection? Yeah. French connection. Right. 
right? Like right. this, the, the, you, this should, this should be like the very, very, I mean, there should be like, I don't know, maybe somebody has a nuke or, <laughs> you know what I mean? We, yeah. I, I don't like think this, this level. Ha- yeah. I don't think it'll happen very often. Be honest with you. I don't think it's necessarily something that was a going concern really. Um, I think it's just giving police, there's nuances to this right around like the pre-crime thing, right. And, and paperwork, right. Less, less paperwork. It's helping someone right in the police right. department. It's help. It's helping them get what they want. It's helping breed, get what she wants. And we've kind of proven to this point that they're what their end motivations are. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely benefiting them in some way. If it's not necessarily calling out something that happens a lot or will happen a lot. Um, it's more like, the, I think it is more on the paperwork and the back end side that's, that's benefiting. Maybe it um, helps with their crew. The, the it's like, it's like come to San Francisco. We have jumps. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> Other people call this Van Ness. Uh, we call this an autocross. If you have, right. if someone happens to run away from you, right? Uh, you know, if you really, if you really like playing Grand the GTA, right? Like you can play in real life in San Francisco. Um, we got Mad Hills, and Lombard is a fun is a fun drive when you're being chased by the cops with five stars. Yeah, we you got Mad Skills. We got Mad Hills. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Um, anyway, uh, a couple more stories here on, on the docket and then um, want to uh, move things on to public comment. But we would be remiss if we didn't point out that finally um, something has started to happen on the site of what used to be the biggest mall at one point in America, Valco in Cupertino. So not only does Cupertino now have the big Apple spaceship, now they have this huge vacant lot that they can do some fun shit with. So we're going to find out what's actually going to happen there. Um. Maybe. Car chase, car chase practice. Car chases. Silicon Valley and a deal that has been in years in the making. The city of Cupertino has reached an agreement with the property owner of old Valco shopping mall site that allows a project to build thousands of housing units move forward. So the city first approved plans to redevelop the area back in 2018. And most recently, there was a dispute over impact fees by the Rise Project. The plans include almost 2,700 housing units. Almost a third of those are affordable. Also space for retail and nearly 2 million square feet of office space. Wilson Walker has an update now. When, I, when they first knocked it down, it was kind of emotional Fuck, for it me. turned into a giant skate park. Because I grew up in the area. Right. My favorite movie theater was across Dirt the street. bikes. Like many longtime Valley residents, Efren Flores has fond memories of Valco Mall, but now, as owner of Holder's Country Inn, he is looking forward to the arrival of thousands of new neighbors and potential customers just across the street. Ooh, Holder's is a good place. You know, it's going to bring in a lot more business, not just for us, but everybody in the community. It's going to yeah. be a great thing for the city of Cupertino as well. You know, a lot of residents, a lot of uh, housing. Getting here, of course, took some time. Finally, it took a while to get everything approved. In 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, we we worked to try to come up with proposals. By 2018, we negotiated a plan. Rod Sinks Uh, is a former Cupertino City Council uh, member and a veteran of the years-long battle of Valco. It's certainly been contentious over time. The council did have a plan in 2018 crafted under California's SB 35. Today is demolition day, move-in day. Let's hope it's in 2022. But then the project ran into a raft of challenges as a group of neighbors sued and a subsequent city council wavered amid the public pushback. I'm thinking about the traffic and the other thing I'm thinking um, about schools. Ultimately, the 2018 project was downsized, dropping a list of community benefits and hundreds of homes. That is the project left standing on the table after everything else. Sinks and many South Bay housing advocates call the original design an opportunity lost. Yeah, and the legislature has continued to insist through laws coming every year that it's time for cities to build housing in our area. And, uh, you know, I think cities, including Cupertino, really need to get on board with that. It's great news, yeah. It's also the biggest thing to come to Cupertino since the arrival of the other notable neighbor just across 280. In fact, the rise, as it's named, is being billed as the new town center. We're in the lucky thing for us is we're right in the center of it. We're literally right in the corner of everything else. And uh, like I said, it's a great, uh, great opportunity for us. 
we reached out to the developer, Sand Hill Property. They did not have anyone who could speak with us today, but they have said that the site is already being prepared for the utility work. The main construction would start later this year. And as for when they hope to have something finished, depending on economic factors, they think conclusion to at least part of the project could come sometime in 2028. That was my guess. Yeah. So, there you <clears throat> go. That's 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 pretty hopeful. Uh, interestingly yes. enough, I think they hired a uh, Wilson Walker because he looks like uh, a little bit like Jimmy McNulty from The Wire. Um, <laughs> that's what I first noticed. So, like McNulty got, I guess they McNulty got young and got a job at the fucking local news. Yeah, he's an investigative reporter now. He got out of that whole junket. So, uh, so uh, I, I, I don't know why everybody like why they so mad. Why well, they had sad about the project? Yeah. Um, why? Why is everybody so mad? Well, the people, the people who are mad that push back and sued over it are just NIMBYs when it comes down to it, right? Like forever, however long they've been in Cupertino or whatever, you know, they'll say, I've been there forever and I, that's not why I bought a house here and pay property taxes and I live behind this and I don't want to see like big towers coming here in traffic and, you know, what are they going to, how, you know, how are they going to account for all the water these people are going to use? <laughs> this comes up, I swear to God. Um, how, you know, what about the schools? Like, what about the schools? If there's more people here, that means more money for the schools and more kids to be in the schools. And that means more money for the schools. So I don't understand what the hell the problem is there. Um, it's just NIMBYs. They just don't want more people coming to their neighborhood. They want, they don't want to deal with um, what that means, and especially affordable housing, right? As soon as they hear that, they're like, oh, well, that just means poor people are right, coming to my neighborhood, right? And they're going to steal my shit. Cupertino's, no, that's... Cupertino's weird in some ways because there's a lot of ways in which it's almost like the suburb of the future, just with like the employment opportunity um, and like all yeah. the all the tech, not just Apple, but there's like a lot of biotech and um, like even like a lot of electrical engineering chip prototyping going on there and stuff. And then in other yeah. ways, it's like the city of the past where the people <clears throat> who like bought their single family home there and wanted it to be like Pleasanton because maybe it was then like Pleasanton is now it won't just pick up and move to Pleasanton. Right. And they, they think, Oh, well um, we got away with, we finally got rid of the mall. We got rid of that damn mall. Now we, <laughs> well, <laughs> we should just build a bunch of single family homes and not, and I mean, not, you know, not build up anything more. You know? By the end, that mall was in dire, it was in dire shape, not oh, only he, like yeah, infrastructure yeah. wise, but just in, in so far as like, there was nothing there except like a movie theater. Yeah, no, these are people who probably would have opposed the mall in the first place, right? When it was right. built in the 70s, right? So, um, yeah, they just don't want anything. It's, uh, what are they called? Cave people, right? I'm citizens aligned against virtually everything, or they just don't want anything built, right? They're NIMBYs. They don't, they, they're against any, any building at all, any development. I, I don't, I don't like, I don't like it. I don't like what they're doing just because they're trying to build Santana Row. Yeah, and then it looks the, the visuals look a lot like California Forever, right? Right. right. Those, well, that's those normal, that's just animated. there's only there's there's only one AI capable of producing those kind right. of things, and it's and these are animated too. These are really even more scary with people like walking <laughs> around. Um, so the, watch out. Uh, this could be yeah, it could be end up being that, and maybe maybe people are right. Maybe the people pushing back are right, and this is just some sort of uh, Peter Thiel wet dream uh, that we're we'll find out about later. Um. Anyway, well, that's that's down ballot uh, for this this week, and then we have one more thing under, and another thing, of course, we uh, we like to get into animal um, uh, interest stories <laughs> here on uh, another thing, and this week we're learning about um, the last elephant in the Bay Area who's going to be reunited with uh, their mate. Oh, I good. hope, but let's let's find out what's going on. I thought they got priced out, but that might have been it they might have had to force back to africa unfortunately oh my god careful there careful careful counsel. oh wait yeah Jesus sorry Christ. yeah sorry <laughs> wait, is this a children's show <laughs> yo careful careful don't, ca don't cancel us please the Bay area is about to get a new home the oakland zoo announced this morning that osh is preparing to relocate more than two thousand miles away this fall he will call tennessee home abc ah, news reporter not africa Rodriguez spoke with zookeepers about the difficult decision to make this move go back to For tennessee two decades osh the elephant has been calling the oakland zoo home but in the fall the african elephant will move to a sanctuary in tennessee the zoo says it's the best decision for his well-being so he can be around other elephants. So he's oh, always been, um, 
a, a very brave elephant. She looks like yeah. she would be in a movie, the lady who loves the, the elephants and the animals. Right. Like elephant lady yeah, yeah, she, of I the mean, night. They're like no 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 like slight at her. It just looks like you couldn't have cast like a better like a, a person this is what you would want the person that loves the animals in the movie to look absolutely. like. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, very interactive, which is part of the reason we know that he's gonna do so well at the sanctuary because he's a super confident individual and he's always been one of our elephants anytime we do new enrichment or give them a different space, you know, he's the first one to explore it and really want to This is when the elephant needs to charge from the background and just trample you know, how everybody. he engages <laughs> with his new habitat in Tennessee. The thirty showed you guys weighs fifteen thousand pounds and it's oh my god feet two inches tall. <laughs> he will be transported in this specially designed air prison trailer for the forty hour trip. <laughs> oh, he's gonna love that. Like most of us, Osh enjoys a good pool day. He also likes yeah. treats thrown in his mouth and playing with toys. Oh, fuck yeah. He doesn't have media plans to bring another elephant. And we don't think that that's the right choice to make right now. And you she's know, like, I, the, she's like, I have been the uh, jail keeper for enough elephants. I am done doing that. They've told me they do not like it. We speak about these things. Space, um, but at this point, you know, this space is not enough for the elephant's social complexity that yeah. we think is necessary. And that's why we feel like the elephant sanctuary is going to give him, you know, that the space and the social complexity and the um, flexibility of their facility so that he'll have choices. The organization In Defense of Animals tells me they are grateful the Oakland Zoo is doing the right thing and leading the way by putting animals' needs first. Osh has lived at the Oakland Zoo for 20 years and they want to give everyone who loves him an opportunity to say goodbye so you still have some time to come out and visit him. In Oakland, Gloria Rodriguez, ABC 7 News. Hell yeah. Aww, that was a good story. That's nice. good story. Yeah. Good good for Osh. That's great. Um, and I'm glad that they're not going to just choice. imprison some other elephant there. That's fantastic. That's, yeah. It's that they're, I mean, zoos are being a lot more thoughtful about these things. I don't think zoos are really rethinking themselves anyway. So it's good that that's happening. Um, and hopefully we'll see more of it. That is, uh, that is fantastic. Well, do you want to read the yeah. show out? Why the hell not? Um, well, thanks for sticking with us a couple minutes uh, over tonight. Uh, Producer Dave, I'm. Um, it's already turned the light red, so public comment will commence very shortly um, with one arm or two or, you know, none, I'm sure, if he really had to. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us for another great episode of Down Ballot. We do this almost every uh, Tuesday. We'll be off next week, but we'll be back in a couple weeks at 7.30 Pacific. Please, in the meantime, get vaccinated. Wear a mask when it's required. Pants are completely optional. We're going to leave you with some audible smoke signal as usual and invite you to have a very peaceful week. Um, because it doesn't seem like many other people are. Have a good one. Peace out. To get the party started Pick up my phone Just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice For the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car Just to get to where they are Here at the local scene Is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette And I hold my drink I look at all my friends They're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage Waiting for MTV Where are those guys Who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand Ready to blaze for me About five minutes later We're all singing We never get the fuck up on stage been like the sea, yeah. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy that band. I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car to smoke another one what? and another one. Woo! Now, just when the magic starts kicking in, I hear we left playing, and you know what time to head in. All right, everybody, now it's time to grab a new drink, spark it if you got it, and then pass it to me. Yeah. We do what we want. And what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want. And what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do 
what we want, what we want to do, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band, enjoy that band. Last up on the field for the show tonight, get down and dirty in five, so we're headed outside to spark up another joint. Now who's got my light? A stoner E, of course, shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch, being who I gotta be. I'm fucked up like the U.S. economy. The truth is, is that I don't think logically. Stone to E, take you on a psychedelic odyssey. Now inside, motherfuckers is rocking me. And outside, shit, we smoke a lot of broccoli. Rocky the roll of your sexy girl be jocking me. Ain't too drunk to fuck, but don't probably do it sloppily. We do what we want. And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Dance with the band and enjoy the band We do what we want what we want to do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Molly say the heat like jamming And it hope it like jamming too Well I gotta say thank you Bob we do Yes I gotta say thank you Bob we do Get